Speaking of that, I remember one time in Philly, yeah. I saw you at a rave, and then you did the Funkin' Pussy, yeah. and then we went out to eat at like 4.30 in the morning, yeah. and then I drove back to Maryland. So it's like, you know, it's a yeah. lot going on. It's a lot going on. A lot going on. But it's all true. Yeah. <laughs> now, that what? being said, the other thing I was always intrigued about is not wanting to like try to find a producer or find right. all these collaborators. Yeah. So why were you so in, I'm gonna do this myself? Because I fired my first band at nine. Nine? Nine, I fired those fuckers. Cause they wanted to go play football. Mm. And I was just like, look man, don't y'all wanna grow up to be fucking rock stars? And it was like, well we wanna play football. Well I was like, y'all fired, motherfucker. And they said, have fun. I said, have fun doing what? They said, playing all the instruments. <laughs> So I had to learn how to play all the instruments. Right. That's why I play bass, guitar, little keys, and drums. Mm -hmm. And just after talking to people, and it was like, well, since I'm an artist, it's personal. Mm -hmm. Like, nobody was gonna create those beats. Nobody was gonna, like, like for instance, Gucci Time was a drum beat. And, um, and when, when, when the cats heard it, it was like, school the ball. You might have to do it on the drum machine because black people don't play drums no more. Mm. This was 85, so people were moving away from Live. Earth, Wind, and Fire right. and moving that the new sound was the 808 or the 909 or the Lindrum. Mm. So I had to, like, nobody's gonna, nobody was gonna program. Like, I took it, and some drummers tried to, like, drummers would get, and they would try to diss me. Over PSK, and I found out I had a guy at Temple transpose like all my drum beats. Said, "Dude, they just couldn't play it <laughs> <laughs> because it's like <laughs> they couldn't fucking operate that shit because in their brain, it you doesn't know, register. somebody yeah. taught them to play drums this way, right? And you taught yourself, and you came up with this music your own self, so nobody." Was, Nobody was going to be able to do it, mm -hmm. so so don't feel like a, you know because you know back in the '80s and stuff like like live musicians they they would try to make hip hop musicians feel like we're we're, we're nothing we yeah. we don't mean anything. Yeah. Um, so nobody was gonna and it, go, it went along with the art because it was just like oh, man I had every like all these album covers I got like every album cover over to Lloyd. Pedro Bell, all this, and it was like I studied that shit, and it was like, when I listened to their music, it was just like, it just, the music is separate without the art, but it doesn't mean much without the art. The art is very good, awesome art, but all of a sudden, you know what I'm saying? You got Mr. Wiggles, and you can see Mr. Wiggles. Well, that's what I was about to say. It's an experience. Yeah, it it's a, a deeper experience. It's a deep, yes, and, and it was. It was, and I'm pretty. I'm a pretty deep cat, so you know. So I say, <laughs> <laughs> everybody, elders, everybody who pretty much heard the, the music was just like, there is no way, any of this, was going to be played on the radio. So I had to make a decision. I made that decision. Was like, well, I own records. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, like Blowfly. Right. That record probably, it went gold. We heard it from the street. Right. Not, not once on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was like, and he had a career. And I was like, well. I can do that. I can do that. Mm-hmm. If that's the way it's going to have to be. But um, up until Am I Black Enough For You, because that was too black for black radio. Um, they were forced to play my music because back then the, the radio stations would call the record stores and say, well, what's selling? Just like, God damn it, school, they still selling that black motherfucker. You gotta play that black ass shit. Right. <laughs> so they would call me up and say, do you have a, a um, radio edit? And I was like, nope, do it yourself. So Lady B from Philadelphia, she started doing my radio edits. And um, I did one radio radio edit myself Saturday night. Okay. And I did it in the studio. I changed the words because, like, Two Live Crew was doing, started to do it. Some of the guys from the West Coast were starting to make records, like, X-rated side, G-rated right. side. I tried that and it was just like, 
That's not you. I almost stabbed that motherfucker who pressed that shit up. I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't stop the presses fast enough. And every now and then, I'm somewhere like I could be like in Amsterdam and on a jukebox, and they, and somebody plays Saturday Night the radio version. I'm just mm. like, makes me cringe. <laughs> I cringe well, when I hear that. I cringe. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard the radio version. Thank so God. I'm glad. But that being said, with radio, I know from our talks yeah. over the years. Lady B uh, was instrumental in kind of teaching you stuff about the business and the fact yeah. that they weren't going to play you. And if you haven't already, Schooly gave me a great interview for my book, The History of Gangster Rap, and an exclusive piece of art. Yeah. And forever indebted to you for that. Yeah. But definitely check yeah. out the book if you haven't yeah. already. And thank you again, Schooly, for yeah. that. But yeah. Lady B, you know, taught yeah. you a lot about the business yeah. early in the game. Yeah. So what were some of those lessons? I can't say any more than this. Cause <laughs> <laughs> well, she was the one. She was just like, look, if you want to, if you want to do this, mm -hmm. it's just like, I'll help you out. Like she said, I'll make sure. Like because if you did the radio edits, it's like, I remember she, she said you're gonna miss some things, and she was telling me it's like it's it's, it's about context. Okay. Not content, but context. Like how you sick because people would say to me all the time, it's like yes, and she would say schools. It's like. Like other people could say bitch and it'll go through and say, but when you say it, you sound like you really mean it. That's why a lot of people don't play this stuff. Okay. And she, she taught me like a lot about how like, you know, how to get paid hmm. performance-wise. Like what is my worth? Okay. You know, especially, she said, especially, she said around holidays, it's like one of the tricks, around the holidays, your price is tripled. No matter what you do, your prices triple because the club's prices are triple. Mm. On Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve, and the day after Christmas, those are the three highest paying gigs everybody makes. Wow. Yeah. So, so no, matter what, no matter what they say, if they say no, they're going to come back and say, yeah, everything is tripled. That's a good lesson to learn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And with uh, PSK, I'd say is one of the most sampled songs in yeah. rap history. Yeah. When it started being used so much, what, what, what was happening in your mind? Like, wow, this is really happening that everybody's coming to me for this song. Uh, I had a lawyer um, in, in like um, 1986. His name was Arthur Mann. And he said, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to buy your publishing from you. Just so you don't sell it to anybody. I remember you told and, me he held it for you. I'm going to sell it back to you in seven years for $35,000. The other thing is, the reason why is people are going to sample your music. And I couldn't believe it. Because I'm like, that's still in the beginning. I'm just like thinking like, well, all these James Brown records, you know, Mandrill, all, you know, all these funky, funky, funky. He said, he said no. He said, your sound like nobody, yeah. nobody's going to be able to recreate it. I mean, if they tried, it's going to be futile because people are going to know what they're trying to do. Right. And anything like this, especially back then with hip hop, you got to go to the original source. Because it's like you heard people replay Funky Drummer. On the 808, it didn't sound like it wasn't the same. It wasn't or the Lin drum, right? When Jimmy Jam and Jimmy Jam, they would play the replay the funky drummer on the Lin drum, and you, heard, you know, so it was just like eh, something just don't. It's not the same. It's not the same, right? So when it started happening, I didn't even know it was happening because I was working with Abel Farrar. I was in the film business by then, right? Because I was um, I left making music for records around 91. You started doing all the scoring. I started doing all the scoring. And I was like in, in San Francisco, I was in like Cannes, I was in Italy, it was, you, know, you understand? So I, was like, yeah. I was like all these places. So I was kind of like separate from what was going on. It's like, um, and I remember the first time I heard like Nice and Smooth, that mix, it was like, all these mixes, I thought they were radio mixes. And it was like, no, nah, these are, these are, these are yeah. actual records. So. By the time um, I brought back my publishing, 
it was worth a million dollars because of all these, it was like Susan the Banshees, all these people, yeah. television, movies, school, it's like people were just using it and, they were, and, and all the songs were going gold and platinum. Right. They so, were big. They were big. Case. Yeah, <laughs> That's Case, another one. yeah. Among many, Biggie. Yeah, Biggie. Yeah. Biggie, yeah. So, so it was, um, so I didn't, I didn't, it was in the back of my mind, but it wasn't, I was like too, it was like being a film composer, man. That's just like working with Abel Farrar was like, that was, that was a year round thing because you get a script and then two years later, you got to read it. And then two years later, that's when they need the music. Mm. So it was like, I was, yeah, I was having too much fun hanging out with actresses and, you know, and it was like, like a, a record label budget was like this and a movie budget was like that. And you know, you know what I'm saying? So I got to hang out in HBO studios and shit like that. So I was, I was having a ball, but I, I wasn't, I didn't diss hip hop, but it was just kind of just like, I moved to my next phase of what I right. wanted to do. And, and be a film composer was one of the things I wanted to do. And that was my opportunity. I want you to listen real close to me. I'm gonna ask you some real simple questions. And I want some real simple answers. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you understand? Yes, I, I understand. You said that you couldn't have possibly been at the crime scene at 11.15 because you were in the bookstore buying my audio book and my hardcover book at 11.15 when the crime scene occurred in Soren's book. The history of gangster rap. So you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying the books. Right, right. At 11.15, I was, I was at the bookstore at, at 11.15 and when, when I, bought, I bought the books and accidentally left them at the store. So at 11.15, you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying books, right? At, at eleven fifteen, I was. We we was when I was leaving. It was, it was some people coming in, and I I, I forgot to grab. But you, you you don't remember who what they look people, like. What they look like or nothing, right? No. Hmm. So. Twelve fifteen. You in the bookstore buying my audio book and hardcover book and Soren's book at twelve fifteen. So you couldn't have been at the scene because you were buying the books, right? Yeah, at twelve exactly at twelve at twelve fifteen exactly. I was at the bookstore. <laughs> You know you know fucked up. Which, which no, one? First you said you were at the bookstore at 11.15 and then you said you was 12.15. You know you know fucked up. He fucked up. Yeah, he fucked up. He fucked up. Man, you, you're confusing me, man. So, you get my book, my audio book, 40 years in Soren's book, History of Gangster Rap, and if you don't, you know you're not fucked up, right? Man, the more those cops ask me questions, the more I wish I bought them motherfucking books. <laughs>